International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. Tonight, we are thrilled to give you a glimpse into the lives of a diverse group of talented leaders from a variety of industries as they discuss the contributions of black Americans and how to inspire a new generation. It's my honor to introduce this evening's host, Bay Area Radio icon, Rennell Brooks Moon. Rennell has been the public address announcer for the San Francisco Giants for the past 16 years and one of the Bay Area's most popular on-air radio personalities, currently with the show on KSQ. Rennell is the only black female public announcer in the Major League Baseball and was recognized as the first female announcer of a championship game in any personal sports during the 2002 World Series. She has since been a part of three more World Series and it's an even year, so I think we got another one coming our way. And has been awarded three World Series rings for her PA duties as part of the Giants dynasty. Rennell, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Roderick. The voice of Macy's, everyone, is Roderick. What's up, everybody? Good evening. What a great night we have in store for you. It is my pleasure to welcome you once again to the annual Macy's Black History Month celebration. Because contrary to what some folks say, this is a month to celebrate. But that's a whole different conversation. I'm gonna keep it positive tonight. Black culture electrifies the pulse of American culture. Always has and always will, yes. From music to fashion and everything else in between. And young sisters that we have with us tonight are at the heart of this revolution. They have creative self-expression and a strong connection to their heritage, which they're gonna share with us tonight. You're gonna get to meet these three extraordinary young women. We're gonna get into their lives and their careers and find out what the future has in store for them and we want to thank them for being here they're gonna show us how, uh, how, show, how show us how they do things right in their careers and how they affect their communities as well all right it is my pleasure now to get this party started and introduce our most distinguished and honored panelists tonight first up an actress best known for her television appearances on the award-winning series Friday Night Lights Parenthood and True Blood. She's a very talented young actress. She's appeared in numerous film and TV shows. I'm so excited about her newest project, which is called Underground. And it debuts on WG in America on March 9th. Uh, and that is the story of the uh, slave revolution from a slave's per perspective and the abolitionist perspective. It's executive produced by John Legend. <laughs> Got a great cast, so looking forward to seeing that. She can also be seen on the big screen, starring opposite Robert De Niro, Edgar Ramirez, and Ursher. <laughs> That's how we say it in the hood, y'all, right? The movie is called Hands of Stone. It's the R Roberto Duran story, and this actress plays Juanita Leonard opposite Usher as Sugar Ray Leonard. I've said enough about her. Let me get her on up here. Give it up for Journey Smollett Bell. <laughs> Woo! Are you getting emotional because we watched her grow up? It's killing me right now. Right. Welcome. Hey, babe. How y'all doing? I'm so happy to be here. Y'all looking beautiful. And next up, she is the Emmy Award winning sideline reporter for your NBA world champion, Golden State Warriors. She is a world champion in her own right on Comcast Sportsnet Bay Area. You see her on the sidelines for every Warriors game making her a champion in her own right. She provides analysis and color commentary for the Pac-12 Network men's and women's college basketball, and also for the WNBA with the New York Liberty on the MSG Network. And this summer, this is huge for her, you guys. She will join the NBC coverage of the 2016 Rio Olympics. 
huge. Give it up for Roz Gold on Wude. She does have a championship ring. She left it in the safety deposit box. I'm going to be her mentor on showing off the rings. I didn't want to do too much. I know, no, it's fine, it's fine. But you know, you like to show them because people don't get to see them every day, right? That's why I like to show it. Anyway, I'm just saying. <laughs> Got your bling, you gotta show it off. And finally, I know y'all are so excited, a Grammy award-winning recording artist. We've watched her grow up too. She has sold more than 25 million albums worldwide. Her new album, Code Red, debuted at the top of the Billboard R&B album chart, featuring her hit, Alone in Your Heart. Please welcome the lovely and talented Monica! Yes! Monica! Yes! Well, please, let's welcome all three of our wonderful panelists today. Look at Monica, just fly. Ain't she just fly? <laughs> Always has been, right? Well, thank you for joining us for our Black History Month celebration and conversation. Uh, let's get right into it, ladies. Let's talk about heritage and what you love most about your heritage as we celebrate Black History Month. Monica, we'll start with you. You look gorgeous, darling. All thank of you do. Thank you. Thank you. I love our strength. Yes. When I look at uh, my grandmother, mm. that's from Noonan, Georgia, and tragically lost both of her husbands and raised her amazing children and grandchildren. And I never saw her look sad. I always saw her look hopeful. I always saw her look um, encouraged, no matter what the situation was. And that was something that I didn't know as a little girl I would need so much in my life because so many things happen that you just don't plan for. Exactly. And when real life happens, you have to have something to go back to. So because of her, my spirituality is intact. My love for other people is intact. And I just think whenever I think of our heritage, she's the first person that I think of mm -hmm. because she was my first example of real strength. Yeah, yeah. What would you say is the, the, one of the best lessons that she ever taught you? Her and my mom have always kind of simultaneously, I always say, uh, taken care of me, especially emotionally, but she used to always tell me to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. And she said that uh, the things you see in front of you, they can be very different if you believe and you have enough faith to get through that moment to get to the greater end of what's for you. And so I just think keeping that with me has kept me. Yeah. You know? Kept you a strong black yes. woman. Nice. We all come from that. What would we do with our, our grandmothers, y'all? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And, Roz, how about you? Heritage, what does that mean to you? Well, heritage was always very important to me, um, especially growing up with one parent who was white, one that was black. And my mom is Russian and Jewish. My dad is Nigerian and Catholic. <laughs> They're bonding. <laughs> They're having a bonding moment. <laughs> I knew there was something right? I liked about her. Also, she used to play ball, so I was like, okay. <laughs> like, really? Basically, we basically, just joined at the hip. <laughs> but um, for me, I remember growing up and my dad would always say to me, make sure you know who you are. Make sure you know where you're from. And he said, you don't want to end up like one of these people who become adults and have to pay a lot of money to figure out where they're from. <laughs> and it was, you know, especially for Africans, knowing your culture is really important. So um, knowing the food, knowing the, the clothing, the colors, the language, um, it was something that I always grew up with, exposed to both sides of my family. And I think what I took from that is being comfortable in my own skin because it wasn't always easy. Um, you know, growing up, I'm from Queens, New York, and... Wait. Wait a second. Are you from New York? Oh, no, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Where are you from? Left Rock, Queens. You're from what building in Left Rock City? Wait. Hold on. What building? This is strange. My what? dad lives in Mexico building. What? We have oh, to talk after. Yeah, come oh come back God. to us one time. Just come Wait. back to us one time. This ladies. is crazy. This is really weird. That's crazy. I'm over here lost because I'm just <laughs> I'm just straight up black. I just, <laughs> we come from Noonan, Georgia. <laughs> Ain't nobody else up in here from Noonan. 
Hey, while we're at it, Texarkana, Texas, all right? Yes. Shout yes. out to Left Back City, though, in uh, Regal Park, New York, as well. But So basically, to wrap that up, growing up in New York, sometimes people would make fun of you because of what you were. So they'd be like, uh, Roz is African, her daddy's from Nigeria, so she was fighting zebras in the lunchroom or something before she came to school. No, seriously. Or my mom didn't really know how to do my hair, so my braids stood up a lot, and I got a lot of fun of my hair or whatever. So I always grew up aware of heritage, but as I got older, I got more just more proud of everything that, that I am and what that means to be in America that way. And uh, it makes me very comfortable in my skin, Renelle. Well, listen, I'm glad that you and Journey have bonded over right. your experiences. That's fascinating. We didn't That's have crazy. enough time backstage to get to know this stuff ahead of time. No. <laughs> but Journey, now you can share with us your experience similar to Roz's. Very similar. <laughs> I mean, you, she just told my story. Right? <laughs> um, no, my, my dad is from New York. He's a Russian, Polish, Jewish man. Um, and my mom is from New Orleans, but she was born in Galveston, Texas. So I got like the best of both worlds. Yes. I, I'm like both of y'all, like <laughs> combined. Monica, she brought it back. She brought yeah, it back. Yeah, Monica, you still in this. But, um, you know, definitely my, my parents, my parents met here in the Bay though. <laughs> yeah, they, they, um, they were working in the movement. They were working with Angela Davis. And um, my dad randomly moved from New York here to be a boxer. I don't know why. He never, ever. That never happened. But, um, you know, I come from two activists. I, and I have that activist spirit in me. Um, and that's something I've always been very proud of. Um, because being in the business that we're in, you know, they want to put a price tag on you. They want you to sell your soul. And my parents raised me to believe that I am worth so much more than anyone could ever offer. And that my soul is not for sale. And so coming from that spirit, you know, it really helps me know who I am. Because people will try to define you. And they will try to tell you you're either this or that, or you're not this, and you're not that, and you're not good enough. And, you know, one thing I just love about our heritage is, is that confidence, is that walk. You know, we have been, we have faced such odds in this country. And every generation has a different obstacle to overcome. But we still trek forward. And that, you know, being on the front lines of change and being these activists, we always make this country better. And we force them to, to, to become better. And that's something I, I, I just am so incredibly proud of, of having inherited that. We stand on the shoulders of greatness. I say it all the time. Strong strength and greatness. Well, Journey, let's stay with you um, and talk about your career and some of the challenges that you have faced. I know that you said your parents gave you a nice, strong foundation because, bless her heart, ain't nothing happened to her along the way. You know, some child actors don't transition very well. <laughs> and we know your mom and daddy raised you right. Thank you. Because you are one of the most respected actresses of your generation. So tell us how you developed a passion for acting. I know you and your, your siblings are all in the entertainment business. So how did that happen with this very talented family? Um, yeah, you know, my older siblings in New York, they wanted to be the Huxtable kids. <laughs> Seriously. And they asked my mom, you know, to put them in the business. And she said no. But, you know, she studied the business for a year and then kind of, you know, went and got them an agent. And they started modeling and doing commercials. And a, a photographer, you know, I was on set with one of my siblings and, you know, with my mom. I was 10 months old. And the photographer was just like, can we put her in the in the photo. And ever since then, I kind of started working. I started off modeling diapers. <laughs> you were born to do this. I guess so. Literally. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, as I got older, I learned, you know, more about the crafts. I worked with amazing actors. And I did this film when I was 10 called Eve's Bayou. And um, that was the first time that I actually fell in love with the craft and, you know, started to understand what, it's, what it means to really lose yourself in a character and how important that creative process is. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate to work with amazing people and learn by doing, by being on sets and being mentored. And I have to give you know, so much gratitude to my mom and my family for keeping me grounded and grace to God because this is a really tough industry and you're right, I, 
was able to avoid a lot of pitfalls. Yeah. You're a survivor and you're extremely talented and we're so happy Thank you're here you. tonight. As are all of these ladies. And Monica, we watched this one grow up too, right y'all? Yeah. Just one of them days. You better sing. Because y'all know I was on 106 KML at the time. Thank you. Jam and that jam, she was just a baby girl. And look at you now. Is this not the 20th anniversary of that single yeah, album? Uh, Come on now. She's still in the game. Now, same as with Journey, you started out very young. Talk to us about the challenges that you faced and, and that foundation that your grandma taught you. How has that served you through these last 20 years? That's amazing. Well, I started working on my first album when I was 12. And I didn't grow up uh, around other entertainers or anything like that. You know, in my family, I had an uncle that made us go-karts out of old lawnmowers. So we didn't really get into uh, the entertainment part of it, but we were a family that entertained each other. And our choir was named after my grandfather, uh, the Alfonso Page Chorus. And I started singing, and my first solo was actually when I was two, and it wasn't bad. It was, <laughs> it was actually pretty good. And uh, then I started singing Going Up Yonder. Oh, yes. By the time I <laughs> got to about four. And then I started singing Safe in His Arms, and it graduated, and I just started learning more and more songs, and my grandmother would teach me hymns. And if I did hear something on the radio, I would sing it back, and uh, she would then sing me another hymn, and I'd have to sing that back. And so it, it, it influenced me in a lot of ways, because if you listen to me, everything that I do has this uh, bit of spirit in it. And the spirit is the spirituality mm -hmm. that lives in me, because the base of everything that I do starts there. And for me, a lot of my life has played out in the public. And that's something I've been very unashamed of, because I feel like real life happens no matter who you are, where you are, what you think you got. And it, it was very important for me not to hide it because I think that too often, because we're afraid of being judged, especially as artists and entertainers, we separate ourselves from what, it, from what is the everyday person. Right. But the difference in me and my mindset is I'm just the everyday person. There was just another purpose for my life and me walking in my purpose allows me to share. So when it's not that good, I sing about it. When it's good, I sing about it. And then I praise him in advance because I know if it's bad again, it's going to get better again. So it's kind of like I'm mixing it up all the time. So I know a couple of them headlines weren't that nice, but it don't matter. <laughs> regardless to what it was, I knew somebody else was experiencing it too. I've been a single mom before. I had two small sons, and I was focused on work and showing them that they could be and do and have anything. And in the midst of that, I met my husband, and six years later, I have a daughter, and looking at all the things we build together. So I just want people to see through me that anything is possible because I'm the little girl that everybody said it was not going to happen wow. for because people don't come from where I'm from and do what I do. Right. So for me, it's more important for me to always share what's happening in my life because there's another little girl that's being told the same thing and she's going to look at me and she's going to say that's not the case because look at Monica that's right. she didn't have that she didn't grow there were no lessons to go and you know and, and I had a family full of fighters my mom my dad didn't make it out of the eighth grade but my mother was like we won't stop here Dad is a hard worker, but guess what? She started educating herself, put herself through a business college, worked her way up at Delta Airline, and now I can fly with people that say, I was at your baby shower, <laughs> you know? But, but she fought for what it was that she wanted to achieve, and I just took that feeling, even without the know-how and what people said was required, and I'm still here today because of it. Yeah. And so whoever is watching that feels like there is no reason to keep pushing forward. I'm hopefully someone they can look at and say, oh, if she can do it, I can too. Oh, you're definitely an inspiration. I hope so. De especially the younger artists coming up too. Definitely an inspiration. And your voice is the truth. Even at that young age, you know, you're talking about your spirituality. Your voice was the truth when she first came out, right? It I used to have to show my ID back <laughs> in the day. Because I would, we would go, and my ID was actually a student ID that, believe it or not, my cousin that manages me is still carrying in her wallet. It's bad, y'all. I'll let y'all see it, but it's bad. And, and it was a student ID because people thought they were passing me off 
to be younger so that I could compete. Oh my goodness. And the truth was, was that I had just been through so much that you didn't get little girl when you met yes. me. Yes. And that it was a part of what I was supposed to share. Yep. So now they know, I mean, you can Google anything now, but back then I was pre-internet, pre-Instagram, pre-Twitter. <laughs> we didn't have all that. So, you know, it, it was just a part of the journey that I'm grateful for. Well, we're grateful for you. That, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you are an inspiration. All of our ladies are an inspiration. Let's talk, to, let's talk to Roz now. First season as sideline reporter for the Golden State Warriors, and she gets a championship ring. Can you, have you even processed all of that? Because I know that when we won in 2010, it was just, I was in a haze the whole time. Have you processed it and that you have a ring and it's your first season? First of all, I'm very thankful for the, for the opportunity, for the blessing. Um, I know that it doesn't have to be that way, and I know many of, many of y'all are Golden State Warriors fans. Okay. <laughs> I work with a really quality group of men as well. On top of all of the winning that they're doing, it's just quality people. And I know that it doesn't have to be that way. I've spoken to other female broadcasters in male-dominated uh, businesses, sports, whether it's basketball, football, baseball, and there have been different types of stories. I've been blessed not to have anything but positive stories. And um, has it hit me? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, already, I've already processed it because we're on to the next season and the Warriors are still doing amazing things, <laughs> if, not, <laughs> if not better. But one thing that comes from it, all those eyes on them, um, it's been a blessing to my career as well. And uh, now I'm just trying to take advantage and do well in all the different opportunities that are coming. A couple more national opportunities now, um, you know, and... and uh, we couldn't be prouder of her, right? You thank all you. could not be prouder. And, you know, I'm listening to Monica speak, and when I heard Monica was going to be on the panel, I'm like, I, I was definitely listening to all the music and watching all the moves you made, and, you know, I was in there battling with you and Brandy and just... <laughs> That's the one that always comes up, girl. <laughs> you could not have it come up. But I was, um, I was listening. I'm, I'm always surprised when someone comes up to me. Like, I'm not maybe where these, where these ladies are in their career, but I'm building towards something. And I'm always surprised even now when sometimes someone will say, I never thought that I would have a career in sports broadcasting or I wasn't interested in this until I saw you doing it. Or I think you're doing a good job. And um, that means a lot, you know, and I, I take pride in that. Roz was a big baller for the Lady Cardinal at Stanford, right? <laughs> Great playing career, and then I'm just so thrilled for your broadcasting career now. People ask me all the time as a little girl that I dream of being the PA announcer, a PA announcer for a Major League Baseball team, but I'm much older than y'all. I'm a child of the Civil Rights Movement, and that was the furthest thing from my mind, going to Candlestick Park in 1962. You know what I'm saying? So. Is this something that you saw as a possibility for yourself, ever? Well, it started to emerge later. Um, you know, I've, I've been playing basketball since I was four. My mom actually gave me a basketball. Um, it was probably my dad's athletic skill more, but it was my mother's passion. She mm. never played sports, and growing up, um, she actually wrote in the school newspapers uh, around the women's teams or the women's activities. She was someone that pushed for women's rights um, throughout her entire life. And honestly, every th positive thing that's happening in my life, I can actually trace back to the, the efforts of my mom. She was the one that gave me a basketball. She's the one that helped me with math homework. She was the one that made me do the homework. She was the one that drew, she created the leagues. There weren't actually, even when I was starting, a ton of girls' leagues um, where I was growing up. She created them. She created the websites for them. She took the pictures for them. She drew, drove all the kids to the games throughout the country. She sent my game tape to Tara Vanderveer at Stanford. Um, and that's how the recruiting connection started there. And. What's sad about it, actually, um, is I wish she could be more aware of what I'm doing now. Uh, my mom's actually diagnosed with early onset dementia, Alzheimer's. Oh. And we all got our stuff, but um, I, wish, I wish she was more aware, like was able to know that, you know, I, I got to cover an NBA team and they won a championship, but um, this is all because of her. So anyway, I was playing ball. I realized that I wasn't really sure if life overseas was what I wanted to do, and that's a, a main path for a lot of women. Chasing, I probably would have chased the middle to end WNBA spot, so I decided to build in broadcasting, and I did a lot of 
random writing for writing for the pa writing for the school paper. I did a lot of digital content. If you're interested in broadcasting, there's no excuse to not have a presence now because everything is digital. You can have a, a vlog, a blog, a bi-weekly uh, something or other that you're putting out there and build your presence and also get some experience. But I went through the digital routes. I did women's college basketball, then men's college, then football, then any sport they would let me on. And then finally, <laughs> this golden, I was doing the analyst work for the Santa Cruz Warriors, the D-League team, and working my way up there. And when Rick Buecher did not come back with the Golden State Warriors and this position opened up, it was actually the Warriors that pitched me to Comcast. And um, yeah. thanks. <laughs> and so. I've just been building since, um, and you know, I, I do have aspirations. I don't know if I thought that I was going to be in broadcasting, but I knew that this was a passion point, and it's been a vehicle in my life, and I keep passion in my life. I'm excited every day to wake up and study and learn and read, and most importantly, I like the storytelling. And as a, for, as a former athlete, I take a lot of pride in doing right by the players, of course being objective but also I'm very transparent and one thing I get a lot about people who are watching the Warriors is hey you seems like you got a good relationship with the guys and I think first and foremost it starts with respect um, I think the guys when guys any athlete respects you when you lead with your knowledge and information and I think they respect that they can talk with me about the game I asked the question about the different um, options of triangle that's, that Steve Kerr is running in his offense when he first came to the team and Andre Iguodala actually pulled me on the court you got an Andre fan? <laughs> and, and showed me the different split cut options because he trusted I would understand it and then I just tried to be a real person and part of my business is rapport I try to lead with knowledge more than you know ever flirting or sexuality which is you know, it can, it can get you places in this business, but it's, it's only as good until the next cute person comes or you age out. That's real. So if you want to stick around, I think it's important to be good. That's real. Yeah. You said it. And you never stop learning at your craft, no matter how many years you've been doing it. As Roz says, she's always prepared and she knows the game. And that's why the players respect her. Draymond says she's got major swagger. And it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that. Journey, let's talk about your career. And since it is Black History Month, can you talk about some of the African-American performers that have influenced you in, you in your career and maybe some whose careers you really admire? Um, well, Samuel Jackson has been a huge influence on my career. Um, he and his wife, LaTanya, are like godparents to me. And I've been so blessed. You know, ever since I worked with him when I was 10, yeah. I've been in his life ever since, and they've taken me to South Africa. I met Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Tutu because of them. Um, they took me to the, um, the shanty towns in South Africa and exposed me to the way our people live right outside of Cape Town. And, you know, they, you know, helped turn me, well, along with my parents, but they helped paved the way for me to become the, you know, to do the activism that I do in the HIV AIDS community. So Sam and his wife, Latanya, first and foremost. Um, Alfre Woodard oh. I, is queen. Yes. She is queen. Viola Davis, yes. queen. Um, Angela Bassett, oh. Yes. oh. Um, you know, I've, again, like I was saying earlier, I've been so blessed to work with great people like that. You know, being directed by Denzel Washington was like taking a master class. Seriously. I mean, he was able to tell me little things that could just open up my world with my craft and really pushed me and challenged me to be better. Um, and, you know, there's things I've learned from all of them along the way, working with them, that I apply to my craft today. You have really been blessed in your career, working with so many greats and the Jacksons as your kind of unofficial godparents. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been, I've been told we got to wrap, but I do have to ask Monica kind of the same question. I know, we could do this all night, right? <laughs> I want to ask you the same question since you started so young like Journey did. Who, who were some of the vocalists that have, I know Whitney was a huge influence on you among others, but who do you really admire in the, uh, in the recording industry? 
It, it would absolutely be, Whitney. Um, I think it's different when you're watching someone on television. And our stature was similar. She was a small woman with this big voice. And she also had a big heart. You know, her smile was a reflection of her inside. It, I always tell people, if you think about her smile, that's what it was like to know her. Mm. And no matter what it was that she was facing, which was pretty much always something, yes. uh, because when we met, I was very young. But when she actually became a part of my life, I was 16 years old. And then at 18, I witnessed a suicide. and. They kept telling me that you really need to speak to her because you're not going to understand that when you come outside of your door, people are not going to look at you like an everyday person. They're going to still look at you like an artist. And that was just something I wasn't prepared for. I always still, I lived in Atlanta, which especially back then, there was no press or frenzy, no paparazzi. You know, I've always gone to the store, done my own thing, so I wasn't prepared for it. And I just remember being in the house, and uh, my family had been there the whole time, talking to me, being right by my side, and I, I could hear yelling. It was almost like pandemonium. And I heard somebody say, you know where she is. Everybody in here know where Monica is. Where is Monica? Which door is it? <laughs> so I'm like, well, who is outside looking for me, especially in the hood, like this? <laughs> And I look out and it's like a caravan, like, you know, the president's coming, right? And it's just black truck after black truck after black truck. And out comes of like the third black truck is Nippy and Bobby, pretty much demanding that somebody show them exactly which place I was in. And uh, so when she comes in, who are these people? Oh, they gotta go. We need, they gotta go. Cause mother needs to talk to you, they gotta go. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to understand, like I, I understood the meaning of support, but you know, I've always had my family, which I've never taken for granted, but to have someone that most people see as someone that's so high up that they're not tangible. You know, it's very easy to write stories about people, talk about people, tear them down, lash out, whatever you want to do, but to actually put your hands on them, touch, feel, and understand, and embrace them, the way she did me, is something that just makes her unforgettable. And she stayed there four days. And I'm talking about where I was hanging was not what she was accustomed to at this point. And she just kept telling me and teaching me. She also taught me about some of the evils that come with what we do. You know, um, she warned me. She said, I feel that somebody around here is going to use this for their own gain, their personal gain. So let's clear it out. Well, I didn't clear it out fast enough. And every Friday, there was a new story about me in the Inquirer, how I wasn't recovering, when I slept and didn't sleep, very close things. And then to find out that it was someone that he actually grew up with that had cooked dinners for us on Sundays. You know, somebody, I, I put Miss in front of anybody's name that's a few years older than me. It's just a respect thing. But to think Miss so-and-so would do me like this and I'm 18 years old, but it was the level of reality that I needed to survive everything else that was coming after this. And Whitney stayed there the whole time. And she made sure, and then she gave me this letter. She said, I have to leave now. This was just before the funeral. And she gave me this letter from Bobby Chris. And the letter was just saying how she's never seen me and I wasn't smiling. So I didn't come this time because mommy told me that you weren't smiling yet, but you would be again. And that was just the reality. So when I look at my influences, she's the greatest one. There are a lot of other great women that have been there for Yolanda Adams, yeah. been there. Yeah. Everything that's happened in my life, good, bad, and different, she never judged me. She never uh, talked down to me, but she, she spoke me up. She would help lift me up all the time. Yeah. And uh, Miss Cece Winans, oh, my goodness. another person that's just always been there. And another person who smiled just kind of lights up the entire room because when she walks in, she walks in with a piece that just really passes all our understanding sometimes. Yes. And so when I'm in the midst, if I see Miss Cece, it goes right away. Yes. So I've been really, really lucky too. I've been really fortunate too. And what a wonderful memory of Whitney. What a, <laughs> what a gift she gave. Where's girl? Monica? <laughs> <laughs> oh, may she rest. We can all hear her doing that too, can't we? May she rest in peace. Please give it up for Journey, Roz, and Monica.
We're going to take a break here. Uh, we're actually going to show you a, a video, and then uh, we want to make sure we have time for some audience questions. So uh, right now, thanks again to our Thank panel. You. I wish we had more time. Really, we could do this all night long. We have a special treat for all of you, though. It, it, it is an exclusive behind-the-scenes montage from Journey's new TV series. Again, executive produced by the great John Legend. Who just won a Grammy the other night. And it debuts on WGN America on Wednesday, March 9th. It is called Underground. And if we're ready, let's take a look. Imagine that all of your liberties, your rights, and your freedom have been taken away from you. And imagine if someone put a camera in the room with you and the group of people who are being imposed upon. What they would see. Because you would definitely figure out a way to get out of that hell. Run! Here's a first look at Underground. Underground is about a group of runaway slaves who head north. Where are you at? It was right behind us. We have in our history this story that's never been told about people subversively saying, no, this is wrong. We're going to break the law. We're going to help. We're going to run for our lives. We're going to take our freedom back. We're in it now. It's all or nothing. Initially, you think I've seen and heard this story a million times. A lot of times, shows that depict slavery show it from a victim point of view. This show doesn't do that. It's a thriller. Yeah. At any moment, these folks that are struggling to escape this oppressive system could lose their lives. I think that that first scene, starting with the Kanye music, starting with that beat, starting with the running, really emphasizes that this is not the show you expect. You ready to do this? We have the story of John and Elizabeth. They're Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and they become spies for the good guys. What you have to do? White people back in the day were abolitionists fighting against slavery, and that story needs to be told, and they represent that. So that's where we find John and Elizabeth at that point where they decide it's wrong, they're going to do something about it. Welcome to the underground. It's time to act, but I can't do it alone. You've never met the characters that you'll be presented with on this show. They're the Justice League of their time. I think they all bring a different thing to the table. You really root for them, whether it's the abolitionists or the slaves. I heard the master say it's over 600 miles. We're going to have to fight for every step. Noah is discovering himself as a leader on the escape, and he has to deal with the consequences. You get caught or not, it's going to be the slaves left behind that pay the price. What's your name, girlie? It's me. I play Rosalie, a young house servant, who is really at this turning point in her life because like any young woman in any era, you are trying to figure out what your identity is. You ever think about another life? Oh yes. I've imagined thousands of different lives. The most dangerous thing you could do as a young enslaved woman in 1857 was dream. Run. Any runaways around here? You know, I wouldn't tell you if I had. Every other second is an intrigue that you absolutely said, no way. That is absolutely not what was supposed to happen, what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> now, I want to see how you get out of this. Only thing hated more than a runaway slave is those that were dare aid him. We've heard about the occupation, and I think it's time for us to see what the revolution was. When we run, ain't no white man going to be able to stop us. WJ in America believes in this show because they know that it's perfect for their network and perfect for what America needs to see right now. Run! Groundbreaking. Are you scared? It's a thriller first and foremost. Intense. I know you was planning to run. It's true and it's honest. Just when you think it's going someplace, it, it goes a different direction. Black in my face, I gotta do what I gotta do. This is how you take your freedom back. Light them up, light them up, light them up. Oh, I can't wait! I cannot wait! My DVR is already set March 9th, WGN America. I wish we had a whole nother hour to talk to Journey about this. That looks amazing. Cannot Thank wait you. for that. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. I'm so excited for you all to see it. We, I just can't wait. Uh, we're going to do some audience questions now, I believe. How are we going to run this? Do we have them? Just anybody? And we'll, it's sure she's saying short, <laughs> shorten it. Yeah, my man, his hand has been up since 530. Go ahead, baby. <laughs> 
It's all right. It's all right. What's your question? Uh, speak up for us. I, I didn't catch that. What? Yeah, well, come on up here, bro. Or here, Roderick. Oh, thanks, Mike. <laughs> How y'all doing? My name is LaShawn, by the way. Uh, I was wondering, in a movie that y'all showing, do y'all show the first picture five dollar bill with two slaves, one white, one white man, two white women? Oh, you talking about an underground? Yeah. Oh no, you know what? Because it's a TV show, there's so much story to tell. We haven't, we don't show that. But oh, okay. who knows what we'll show in season two? <laughs> Tune in. Ooh, there'll be a season two. Oh, that's even more exciting. Thank you, young brother. Who's it? Come on over. And then once you come over and... Yeah. Go ahead with your question. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, being in uh, also a very, very male-dominated space, I struggle with sexism in the industry that I'm in. Um, and given that you all have such a diversified um, industry line, I would love it if you could, I know you touched up on it a little bit, but if you could really, like, if you could give any advice to somebody like me in terms of, you know, the struggles, um, and just that one piece of, like, just X, Y, Z, so I could take home, um, and for the ladies that might also be struggling with it as well. What are you pursuing, by the way? I'm in um, career sales. Career sales, okay. Yeah, yeah that's male-dominated. Super Still, male. Yeah. yeah. Ladies, how are you handling being in a male-dominated industry? Roz, I guess we'll start with you, dear. Well, I think that one thing that helps me, not even just because it's a male-dominated business, but especially in the sideline reporting role where there's not much that's, there's not a lot that's in my control. I'm very much the reactor, um, is preparation. So I think if you're trying to be, first of all, you want to be taken seriously, right? Because it's a male-dominated field. I think being prepared helps. I think your confidence helps. People can read it on you. They can tell if you feel secure. Uh, and also remembering to, that these people are human, you know, um, and, well, we're in different fields, but also just building rapport with one another. Um, I think that people often will be more likely to work with you and want to work with you if they feel there's a connection that's genuine. Um, so confidence, rapport, and preparation really help me in a male-dominated field. I would also suggest that you nurture every relationship that you make because I, I don't know for you all, but for me, every, every gig I've ever gotten is because somebody referred me for it because I had good relationships with everybody. It's, as you're going up, <laughs> you know, don't burn any bridges. Because you, you never know when your next opportunity is going to come from. Yeah. And you know what, I'll, I'll jump on that, Ronell, because we're in similar fields as well. Um, not trying to do it alone, right? So you need to create not only relationships, but mentorships. And it doesn't only have to be women. You can find men who are your mentors and establishing, you know, the right boundary lines within all of those relationships, right? Because there might be some men who will mentor you with expectations. A lot, is, if you're in a male-dominated field or in any field, a lot of times the guys, the people higher up are men. So you need to be able to navigate those fields while also drawing your lines. And I'm already going to tell you that that will be hard sometimes. <laughs> yeah. One more? Okay. Come on, dear. Thank you, Robin. Good evening, glad that you all are here. The middle-aged ladies want to shout you out for following good <laughs> footsteps. <laughs> um, so as a middle-aged woman, I had a daughter who was a theater arts person, and now I have a granddaughter who is very dramatic. So, <laughs> so, you know, she might be going in a certain direction. So what advice would you give to moms having been young children who, um, grew up in a certain industry to maintain a balance and maintain a childhood while pursuing a career as a child? Um, for a mom or a grandmom, I would give you the advice that my mom always gives to other mothers and that's you have to say no. You have to learn the power of no. Um, it's going to be your job to protect them. I would encourage them to study their craft, make it about the art. 
Not about being famous, not about having followers or the celebrity of it, but make it about the craft. And, and if she is in theater, that's an amazing place to start. Keep that up. Continue her education well throughout college. Um, being on sets, for me, that was my college. You know, but my sister went to college. My brothers went to college and studied theater. I would just encourage you to not let her quit. If that's really her passion, don't let her quit, but also protect her. You know, as I was saying earlier, you have to give her that, that power of no. Like, you know, what, that was one of the greatest gifts my mom gave me is, is knowing that I don't have to do any, everything. I don't have to be everywhere and I don't really, you know, have to always say yes just because I want this person to like me or just because I want to get a job. Like, you know, I can say no to roles that are, that are something that I wouldn't be proud of. I don't have to be a part of things that I'd be ashamed of. I don't have to sell myself, you know. So that would be my advice. Study and know how to say no. Monica, you want to speak to that as well since you started out equally as young as Journey did? I would have to say don't ever forget that no one knows more about your child than you. I think what happens and what you hear oftentimes, and I was very fortunate because my mom said, I don't know anything about the music business, but I know my child. So there were times where she reminded me that okay, you've had enough, you, 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 you're tired, a lot is happening in your life, you're 19, guess what, take a break. You don't owe anybody anything but yourself at this point, you gotta take care of yourself, you gotta be whole in order to be a great, be a great artist or be great at anything. So I think the, the fact that I never felt pressured to be an artist made it more enjoyable for me because I think a lot of the reasoning for what they call child celebrities or child prodigies, whatever you want to call them, the, the reason I think some of them are so sick in trying to make the transition or they're sickly mentally in different ways, they're just sick because a lot of times parents live vicariously through the children. So they're being forced to do things that no longer really interest them. You know, there were times in my life where starting at 12, I just was interested in other stuff. It's not that I took my life and what God had given me for granted. I just sincerely was interested in other things. So having the kind of family that let me know that was always okay played a major part in how I made decisions. And also, again, my mom always said, they may know more about the music business, but I know more about my child. So just keep them in the forefront of your mind and do not let them leave you. <laughs> you know, you go with them and you have advisors to help you help them, but do not leave them and let them go. Yes. All right. There you go, mom and grandmama. Oh, I believe that's all the time we have for the questions. I know, you guys. I know. We should have started at 3 o'clock. I, 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 listen, I'm just a messenger. Get on my case, y'all. But listen, we want to stop now because you have an opportunity to get your pictures taken. So let me tell you what's going to happen next. What do you think of formation? Okay. All right. Okay. She will uh, tweet her answer. We're going to have to move everything to social media now. All right, we do have a special Black History Month contest, and this is how it works. You can take a photo and be a Black History Month style star. You will be featured on the Black History Month page of Macy's.com slash celebrate, and you can enter to win a $100 Macy's gift card. <laughs> Winners will be announced at the end of the event, so please stick around for that, everybody. Uh, don't forget Underground, March 9th on WGN America, starring Journey. Shout out to her brother Jesse on Empire, okay? Roz, the Doe's back in action Friday night after the All-Star break. Comcast Sportsnet Bay Area, be sure to check her out. And also, I can't wait to see her handling it at the 2016 Rio Summer Olympics. Huge! And baby girl Monica, Code Red is in music stores now. Right now. And oh, by the way, I think if you make a $25 purchase tonight, Macy's purchase, you will receive a copy of Monica's Code Red. Is that all right with you? All right. 
So listen, y'all, don't forget, keep posting. We're going to post our answer to the formation question, which, by the way, I thought was fantastic. Wait, can I just say one more thing about Beyonce? Y'all watch, watch the Grammys Monday night? Did she just walk out with no introduction at the end of the show? Did y'all catch it? Nobody introduced her. It was silent, and she just came out angelic and just stood, and everybody just bowed down to Queen B. Michael Jackson didn't even do that. He always had an introduction. No introduction necessary. We love our B. Thanks for bringing her into the mix, brother. But we're going to get his question out no matter what. Don't forget to keep using hashtag Macy's Culture and hashtag MyBHM Style, My Black History Month Style. We hope you'll come out to other Macy's events, everybody. And can we give it up for your staff and management at Macy's for holding this annual event every year? Thanks to your staff and crew. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we got a lot of Monicas here. Thank you, Monica, on staff there. <laughs> One more time for our panel, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Now get that $25 purchase and get your code red CD by Monica. And keep supporting these young ladies, our entertainers on the rise. Good night, everybody. Good evening. My name is Eileen Murphy Reed. I'm President Emeritus and uh, founder of the San Francisco chapter of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. I'd like to thank Macy so much for this wonderful opportunity and program that they put on uh, for Af of African American history. It is delightful. The speakers were terrific. And they even gave us food and Pellegrino. Thank you so much. We're there to be commended. And of course, for our moderator, she was terrific. The Giants are so fortunate to have her. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank them for the San Francisco chapter of National Coalition of 100 Black Women. It was terrific, thoroughly enjoyable. So now I'm going home and tell my, my son how much I enjoy this. And again, I commend Macy's, and I perhaps do a little more shopping. 